This is a very detailed guide to customizing your Xbox Elite Series 2 controller using the configuration menu. I'll explain what each option on that menu does, and I'll also show how to implement each of those options. Use the chapter titles if you just want to learn about a specific option. First, we need to get to this screen. Getting there is a bit different depending on whether or not you're on console or on a PC. On PC, you need to have the Xbox Accessories app installed and running and once it detects the elite you are set on console go to settings which will be at the top of the screen then go to devices and connections on the left and controllers and headsets on the right if it's your first time coming to this section, you may see a slideshow talking about the features, and it may have you give the controller a name. After that, you'll land on this screen, which is where you need to be. From this point forward, everything will be the same, regardless of whether or not you are on a PC or a console, but the colors of the menu might be different. And now we'll start talking about the changes you can do. Go ahead and select Configure, before you start customizing things, you need to select an existing profile or create a new one. All that is done on this screen here. If you have any existing profiles, they will be listed either here or down here. If anything in that section says something besides default, then you already have one. If you want to start configuring, highlight one of those profiles and select the pencil icon right here and just hold there for a minute. If you want to instead create a fresh new profile, select New Profile. It'll ask you to name it. You could call it the name of the game you're going to be using it for. Whether or not you're editing or creating a new one, you should arrive here on this screen. This is where all the different customizations happen, and in a minute, I'll go through each of those customizations. But first, before you can get any customizations to be recognized by your controller, you have to drop the profile into a slot. So let's pretend I just made some changes using this screen and I'm ready to implement them. I'll then hit B to go back to the profile screen. The name of the profile I just configured is out to the bottom left. I'm going to make sure it's highlighted, which makes it appear here on the right. And in this drop down menu, I'm going to select a slot to put it in. That profile now appears in this section, which shows the three different slots. Notice the white bars out to the side. Those bars correspond to these bars that you can toggle through on your controller using the button that's right above them. Since I dropped my profile into slot 1, I need to toggle the lights until only one of them is lit. Slot 1 is now active, and my custom configurations are now in place. If I want to turn them back off, I can just press the button until no bars show at all. It goes without saying that you can toggle between three different configurations. You just have to create three different profiles and have each one assigned to a different slot. You could create more than three profiles, but you can only assign three at a time to a slot. Now I'm going to go over how to remap buttons. For example, you can make one of your paddle buttons on the back, duplicate the LT button, go into an existing profile or create one, and that'll bring you to this screen. Here you'll see the default mapping of all the buttons. Notice that the four paddle buttons are set to duplicate the ABXY buttons. So there's already some remapping in place. Highlight whatever button you wish to change the mapping to. For my example, I'll choose the far right paddle button and I'll hit A and it'll bring up this screen. The parts that say shift will be explained in the next chapter of this video. For now, I'm just gonna leave this screen as is and hit A again. Here it gives me a list of other buttons. I wanna pick the one that I want my right paddle to activate. Before I pick it though, I'll point out that there's other things you can do besides map it to another button. If you hit RB, it'll move to the action tab. And from there, there's a whole set of interesting options like magnifier, which allows you to zoom in on the screen, or high contrast mode, which looks like this when you press it. 
hit RB again, and you'll see some selections that allow you to map keyboard entries. Even if you don't have a keyboard, I could in theory assign my button the letter A, and then whenever I press that button, it displays the letter A. But I cannot assign a whole word to a single button. But for my purposes, I'm going to back up to the previous screen by hitting B. And under the first tab, I'll select LT. That'll bring me back to this screen. I'll hit B to back out. It'll show me the change on the screen. If it says something about shifted, just ignore that part for now. The change is now in place, so I can either leave the screen up or pop into a game, or I can just hit B to back out completely. But I do need to make sure that slot one is selected on my controller. And now when I'm playing my game, hitting the paddle button allows me to do a quick downscope. This could help reduce wear to the LT button. Now let's take the remapping a bit further by incorporating the shift feature. In layman's terms, this allows you to remap a button, but that remapping only happens when you hold down another button. It works pretty much the same way the shift button works on a keyboard. Holding it down allows you to use the secondary functions of the keyboard. First, let's start with a clean slate and reset everything back to the way it was. On my profile here, I'm going to select restore to default and then select Restore on the following screen. I'm going to highlight the rightmost paddle button once again and hit A. This time I'm going to leave the primary field as is. I'll instead select the Shift field. And here I have the same options that I covered in the previous chapter, except for the keyboard shortcuts. Those say coming soon for some reason. I can assign other buttons to the paddle or other functions like muting the TV, but I'm going to once again choose LT. It'll bring me back here and I'll hit B to back out. I'm only halfway done with what I need to do, but if I look at what it's indicating there, it shows that I now have two buttons mapped to that paddle, the Y button and LT when shifted. Now what I need to do is assign a shift button. It can be any one of the other buttons besides the paddle that I just altered. I'm going to choose D-pad right. So I'll select it and hit A. I'm going to ignore the first two fields and just go down and click the box that says use as a shift button. You may have noticed it grayed out the other selections when I did that. I'll hit B to back out. Now it shows that the D-pad right functions as a shift button. Note in becoming the shift button, it has lost all other functions. I can't even use it to navigate these menus if I have slot one activated. So it's important to choose an unimportant button to be your shift button. And just to show how it works, I'll head back to the game and make sure slot one is highlighted. In order for the remapping to be in place, I have to hold the D-pad right. As I'm holding it, hitting the rightmost paddle button activates the push of the LT button, which aims down the sights. If I don't hold the D-pad, the paddle button reverts to its default, which is the Y button. Now let's discuss the next two things we can customize, the left and right thumbsticks. Let's establish the basics here. As you probably know, the thumbsticks allow for a range of input. Here, if I press forward slightly on the left thumbstick, my my character moves slowly, let's call it a 5, but if I press all the way on the thumbstick, my character walks fast. Let's call that a 10. It's a 1 to 1 relationship. If I press with a force of 5, the character moves with a force of 5. I realize it's not exactly like that, but bear with me. If we return to this screen and tab over to left stick or right stick, we can alter that 1 to 1 relationship. We just need to select the sensitivity curve box and we choose from five settings. Default is that one-to-one -one relationship I just described, but if I select delayed, that means if I press with a force of five, the game reads it as a three, basically. The graph they give you isn't labeled, but here I'll label it for you. It gives a good representation of what that particular curve does. So my character is going to move more slowly than expected when I move slightly on the stick. However, when I press it to an 8 or a 9, it catches up quickly. Why make such an adjustment? One reason could be to increase accuracy. 
You can also choose aggressive, instant, and smooth. Each of their graphs give you a good idea of what each of them do, but it also shows it another way on the right. Here, I can set it to aggressive, and when I press the stick, notice how the readout breaks into two pieces when I get close to a full push. The white one represents the actual physical push of the stick. The blue one represents how much of a push the game registers. Note that the blue is from my player profile. Some of you may have a different color that appears for the registered movement. Just to finish my thought about this readout, if I give it an eight out of 10 push, the game will register it as a 10. It's aggressive. Under each of the five different styles is a curve adjustment. Moving that slider left or right makes adjustments to the graph. It makes the key characteristic of that curve more pronounced. Like if you chose aggressive and move that slider all the way to the right, the aggressive part of the graph becomes more aggressive, for lack of a better term. Stepping back for a moment, it's important to know that whatever game you are playing may already have some curve adjustments built into the programming, regardless of whether or not you have an elite controller or not. So whatever changes you are making in these configuration menus, they will basically be laid on top of the curves already built into the game. An adjustment you make for Titanfall 2 may not work the same way for Fortnite. You need to experiment within each game to come up with a scheme that works for you, or at least ask other players from that same game what scheme works for them. This is where it gets complicated. There are three calculation settings you can choose from for each thumbstick, radial, axis independent, and true diagonals. Microsoft does not do a good job of explaining the differences between them, and if you ask Microsoft on their own message boards, they will say there's no documentation available for them to explain it to us. But using the diagram that is provided on the right side of the screen, we can give ourselves a good idea of how these calculations affect your chosen sensitivity curve. Let's set the curve to delayed and move the slider so that it's very delayed. And for calculation, we'll set it to radial. My physical movement is represented by the white bubble. When I move it straight up so that it sits right on the white line, you can see the registered movement in blue lags behind. It's not until I move further beyond the white line that the registered movement catches up to the physical movement. So far, there's no surprises. It's doing what the curve out to the left says it should be doing. Now if I move in a diagonal direction, it stays delayed when I'm barely on top of the white line, and it catches up when I move past the white line. It's behaving the same way as when I pushed straight up. That, in essence, is radial calculation. It behaves the same way no matter which direction I'm pushing. Now let's do the same test with axis independent calculations. While keeping the sensitivity curve as delayed, if I push up again and sit on the white line, it's delayed. And it looks to be about the same as when I had it on radial. If I push diagonally, however, look how far back the registered movement is. If I switch back and forth between diagonal and up, you can see that the registered movement changes quite a bit between the two positions. This is the essence of axis independent. The sensitivity curve you choose is going to be more pronounced when pushing diagonally than it is when you push directly up, down, left, or right. In this case, since I have the curve set to delayed, that delay I gave it is more pronounced when I push diagonally. Just to drive it home further, if I set it to instant and move the slider so it's aggressively instant, the registered input in blue reaches 100% much earlier in my push if I'm going diagonally. So what about true diagonals? I played with it for quite a while, and for me, it pretty much behaves the same as radial. It may be using a different equation, but it's giving me the same results. 
when it comes to these calculations, there's a deeper history than you might realize. Apparently, all Xbox controllers use Axis independent calculations, except for the Series 2 Elite, which by default uses radial. Many players who upgraded to the Series 2 noticed the difference right away, and it went back to feeling normal again when they set it to Axis independent. But what matters most is how those calculations feel in the game that you play. Most people report that the Axis Independent is better for first-person shooters, allowing you to snap your aim into place. One source says that the Axis Independent is like a graph with a small number of possible points, and Radial is like a graph with a large number of points. Having a large number of points seems like it would increase precision, but everybody's hands are not perfectly steady. Snapping into fewer points provided by Axis Independent makes for a more steady experience. That's just a theory, but that's the way it feels in my own experiments. When using Radial or True Diagonals, it feels like I'm overshooting my intended movements, but True Diagonals does feel a little bit tighter than Radial. One final note, if you don't have a slot selected at all, it feels like it goes back to the default of Radial. If that's true, then to use one of the other calculations, you have to have a profile created, and the slot for it has to be activated. Just like you could with the remapping, you can use the shift function to instantly make thumbstick changes on the battlefield. It's more useful than you might think. Here I have it set so that when I push on the leftmost paddle button, my aim slows down, so I have more precision. That's because it's putting a delayed sensitivity curve in place when I press the paddle button. When I let go of that paddle, things get fast again. You can probably imagine how this could be useful. Here's how I set that up. I set assignment to shift. I then set the sensitivity curve to delayed and I changed the calculation to axis independent. If I move to one of the other option screens and move back, it looks like I lost my changes, but they're still there. They reappear when I change the assignment to shift again. Then I also need to make sure I assign that bumper button to be my shift button, like so. On the triggers page, you can make adjustments to the range of LT and RT. There are two sliders, and if you highlight the upper one, you can adjust how much you have to press down before the game begins to receive your input. The other slider makes changes to the upper limit of how much input the game receives. The diagram on the right allows you to test it. In some ways, it's a digital version of those mechanical switches you have on the bottom of your controller. Those put a physical limit on the range, but adjusting it on the menu doesn't change how it feels physically, if that makes sense. If you want, you can make both numbers on that slider the same, which turns the trigger into a normal button, much like the trigger buttons on the Switch Pro controller. If you checkmark the mirror triggers box, it makes your adjustments the same for each of the two trigger buttons. On the vibration screen, you have a slider for each of the four motors in the controller. It's defaulted to full power, but when you move the sliders to the left, you can decrease the forcefulness of the motor. What's cool is that it'll vibrate each time you move the slider to indicate what the new adjustment feels like. If you move the slider all the way to the left, it turns off vibration. That's a good thing to do if you want to conserve battery power. The last section is the color page. It allows you to make adjustments to the color and brightness of the glowing Xbox button on the controller. The results are instant. The brightness slider is pretty self-explanatory. If you go down to the color presets section, you can pick among a lot of colors. There's one that says match my color, which allows you to make the light match the color scheme associated with your profile. You may not even remember that you have a color of your profile, but you do see it often. It's the selection color that goes around the buttons. At least if you're on a console, it is. So if you want your menu to match the button on your controller, go ahead and select match my color. 
If you want even more control over the color, select custom and all these options appear, including the option to enter an RGB hex code. If you do that, I admire your attention to detail. While these color changes may seem trivial, you can create a different color for each profile. So when you toggle the different slots, you can toggle the colors as well. This can help you recognize what profile you are using. So that's all I had for you today. If you have any questions or any additional information to add, please do it in the comment section below. Here's a couple more videos regarding your Elite controller. Have a great day, everybody.